Apparently recording's in progress. <whistles> right, here we go again. Second podcast. Um, with me, James Muir. Uh, me, Jay Stokes. And our very special, very anticipated guest, Harry Basiljet. Hello. How are you? Yeah, really good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No probs, no, we've been really looking forward to it. Yeah, massively. Lovely to see your uh, mug again. <laughs> so we're going to kick off with a bit of a warm-up, just to see what's been going on. I assume Jay, um, seeing as the first podcast we had, had 170 downloads in eight different countries and three different continents, you've been struggling to walk down the street without yeah. getting recognised. Yeah, I've been keep getting stopped by uh, the thousands. Uh, I went down, just down to the local bakers in, uh, in Wimborne and I signed about 100 sausage rolls and, and stuff. It was, uh, I'm not sure if that's because they thought I was, I was Ed Sheeran, but yeah, no, they uh, just kept shouting at me, be more rugby, be more rugby. So. <laughs> um, again, I'd like to say thank you to Wimborne and Smacks for opening up the club for us to come and host our podcast. We've got a new bit of kit, so we're recording this one oh, yeah. uh, in a little bit more definition than before. What we do with it, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but yes, this week missed a bit of rugby. Yeah, but um, the Six Nations, a bit of controversy over the Italy game. I, I find it, and this is always the thing with the Six Nations, is that all of a sudden all these people that don't actually watch that much rugby, which is fine, or sort of not, but come out of the woodwork and then they see something like that that they don't understand. And it blows their mind. Now, the rule, I'll get straight into it because, you know, I've had so many people at work, at the club, and so much stuff on social media, people not understanding why Italy had to go down to, in the end, 12 people. But And that is because, you look at it this way. So, say, for example, we're out here and it's Wimborne versus Litchit. Okay, Litchit are dominating the scrum. They are scoring tries from a number eight pick they are all all over us unlikely. if we just went say again Baz unlikely unlikely harsh um, and that they they then but you know we could then say oh, oh sorry guys you know our props injured and we need to go down to uncontested scrums you've just taken away that team's best attacking weapon now before you know, that was unsanctioned. That was, oh, God, those cheats, they've done it again. You know, the props on the sideline doing press-ups and can't scrummage. But actually, to take away that player from them really actually enforces that the last thing you want to do is to go down to uncontested scrums. Now, obviously, it's a freak thing where your, your starting hooker gets injured and then your replacement hooker, well, he escaped one red card and then eventually got caught in the end. I think he, uh, he had a bit of a point to prove. He obviously wasn't happy with the selection. And then... Um, you go down to 13 and then they discipline cost them again and they go down to 12. I don't personally, I don't think there's anything controversial about that. The laws are the law and they're there for a reason, but that's just my opinion and take on it. What about you, Baz? Did you watch? Yeah, I was watching and I'm afraid I have to, I have to agree with Jay. Um, they are there for a reason. And I know why people can think it's unfair, especially in a contest like that, where it's a sort of seen as the underdogs and then, you know, suddenly they're playing with 13, but, you know, the rules are there for a reason. Like you say, the scrum would have been a massive attacking platform. And, you know, just because that was taken away, I don't think that should be then handed to Italy. Mm. So they are there for a reason. They've always been there. You know, like you say, it's freaking, you don't see it very often, but. We see, it, you know, we, you know, I was involved in the game at Bridport the other week and, and, you know, you see it, you see it then and stuff, you know, we, nearly had to go down to uncontested. They nearly had to go down to uncontested and that. And it happens a lot. It's one of the very few rules that was going on at amateur level that they've gone, actually, you know what? This could happen at international. And I don't think, to the best of my memory, that it's happened recently in international, but it, but it has now. Mm. You know, you look at the, you know, you look at a few years ago when Italy destroyed the, the game of rugby that we know it. And, you know, it used to be have to be two people on their feet competing over the ball one from each side, and now it's just one person over the ball because they'd realised, oh, if we don't put anybody in, there's no off-sideline. You know, mm. Our, mm. that comical event. Then you know, when you've got James Haskell and 
and Dylan Hartley asking <laughs> Roman Poit, uh, yeah. how, how, how do you play rugby? How do you play yeah. rugby? How do you play rugby? <laughs> uh, which was brilliant, but you know that you know that was a bit of banter from Conor O'Shea, one of the uh, Italy head coach at yeah, the time. Just thought, you know, we're not going to win this game. What can we do to upset people? I, I admire stuff like that. I do, I do like it, but I don't think at any point at all Italy ever went. We're going to go down to uncontested because we're never going to get hosed in the scrum by Ireland. I think it was a genuine. Oh, really, we've ended up in this situation. So mm. it's a, it's a, it's a difficult position to be. But you know, it goes back to what me and Baz were just saying. Laws are laws. And what about yourself, Baz? Have you played this weekend or? Uh, last weekend we had Jersey at home. Uh, I wasn't involved, um, but I was obviously down, carrying on the waters, and cheering on the boys. Um, In the dream. Big win for us. Came back from fourteen nil down to win it twenty one seventeen, which is a massive result. And Cornish um, in the context of second in the league. Is that right? Yeah, so we're second in the league, three points behind, but we've got two games in hand on first at the minute. So, um, and we've got first uh, next weekend. So we've got Doncaster away. So you dreaming about promotion? No, nobody is anymore. No one is. Maybe That's that, all been that done. a joke. And adjusted. That that is a joke. I, I cannot believe they're not promoting anybody. What, I know. What, what what was the chat like when that when that came through? You know my. You know, as it often does when the championship gets mentioned, my first thought was, oh, poor Baz. Do you know what I mean? That goes, you know, do you, has that taken any spice out of the competition at all? What was the general, what was the feel? You know, you're in that world. You know, when that news broke, I felt like it, you know, it didn't break very loudly. But, you know, hang on a minute. You know, we were talking about possibly Ealing Trailfinders or Doncaster or you, you know, coming up into the Prem. And now we've got nobody coming up. Um what what are you know what's it been like in that camp? Um, so I'll be honest. Um, Pirates have always said, and especially this season, we've said regardless of where we finish in the league, that we won't be in a position to go up. Like we just don't have the finances okay. um, to do it now. So you you have to buy shares in Premiership Rugby when you get promoted, which I think are in the region of about seven million pounds. Which you know a local Cornish club, which we are. Mm. Um, you know, we don't have we, we don't have that sort of money and those sorts of finances. Um obviously the big thing which has now stopped Ealing and Doncaster is it's it's this whole thing around having to be able to seat ten thousand people. Um which, you know, when when you're only pulling three thousand people to a game, it seems ludicrous that you yeah, have to be mental. able to that's mental. seat ten thousand. But um, you know, we see it. You look at the likes of Sale and Worcester and Wasps, how often do you see them fill their stadiums? Yeah, never. You know, you look at and you know, you think when London Irish were at the Majeski, like what a mm. joke that was. Like there was literally nobody there. You know, it was like yeah. COVID had already happened and everyone was watching from home. I, I just think yeah. that is nothing but negative. That there is no positive that can that can come from that whatsoever, yeah. other than you know, you know, you think probably, you know people like Bath, you know, they're licking their lips. They're going, you know what, doesn't matter. We can, you know, throw these games and we're going to keep on going how we are. I just I personally feel I was always massively pro promotion and relegation. And I, I get why it happened. Um, you know, you, you look to like New Zealand and stuff like that. They're a poor club game. You know, nobody goes and watches that because everybody's just saying, everyone's just staying. You know, there's no, you know, you think about those horrible, awful games between like Newcastle and London Irish where it's like, Somebody gives away a penalty, they're getting relegated. Like you don't get those games anymore, which is, I think, really sad to see. But another yeah. bit of controversy we've been going through um, years of Six Nations, where there's been no dropout zone. Um, they've talked and talked and talked about Italy dropping out, and maybe South Africa coming in, or or maybe another club, um, a, another nation coming in. Do you see that the same as the situation with the Prem and the Championship, or? Do you think actually it's a good thing for the Six Nations? I'll let you answer first, Baz. Yeah, um, I'm I'm personally in the camp. You know, I'd hate to see Italy taken out of the competition. Um, but at the same time, you know, as far I was listening to the Good, the Bad and the Rugby last weekend. Um, and I think they were making the point around how, because of time zones, when... South Africa are playing in the rugby championship. Their games are at two thirty in the morning, 
half five in the morning and they have no following. No one watches the Springboks because their games are at such awkward times unless they're at home. Mm. So I know when rugby was created for, for some reason, and it's obviously because of the seasons, there was this big split and you had Northern Hemisphere rugby and Southern Hemisphere rugby. But, you know, South Africa are now saying, why does it have to be like that, you know, logistically and commercially? It would actually work a lot better if you stuck to your time zones and played rugby that way. So you obviously had your Japan, Australia, New Zealand playing, and then you could obviously incorporate us and New Zealand uh, and South Africa. And, you know, Argentina, with the way that Canadian rugby and US rugby is coming along, you know, there's no reason they couldn't have almost like an America's League potentially, yeah. you know, running amongst themselves. Which would be, you know, everybody bangs on about a global season and stuff like that. But logistics wise, that's just not possible. Like, I just don't see how how you could have a global calendar. How, how would that work? You know, with time, taking in time zones to consideration alone. I just don't, I don't know, mm. I, I, I don't see it working. You know, we're, we're trying to grow our game at every single level. But to grow it, I personally think the best way to grow it is to get as many people watching it as possible. And if you're putting on games at stupid o'clock in the morning, nobody's going to watch that. Nobody's going to watch that. And then mm. it's not growing. You know, you look at a sponsorship. Oh, should I sponsor, say, for example, the Super League that's going to be on at half past one in the morning? Um, you know, you look at who sponsors the Guinness, sponsors the Six Nations at the moment, don't they? You know, mm. who's going to see that? Who's going to see my logo? Who's going to see my brand? Why on earth would I pump hundreds of thousands and millions of pounds into something that nobody's going to see? Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. I agree with you, Baz, massively. Yeah, and just the point on Italy, I don't see what good, you know, look at the strides they've made recently. Yeah. Well, um, we discussed the under-21s uh, under victory. Yeah. Under-20s yeah. victory. Beating England 6-0. Mm. Yeah. Classic. That's mad, I'd love to watch that game. Yeah, one for, one for the purists. Yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but flair in that game, I'm sure. <laughs> you, don't hear any, you, know, you don't hear anybody talking about, you know, Wales getting relegated, do you? You know, you know, Wales have got nobody coming through. There's no next no. step. You know, Italy have got a pathway, a gen- and that comes from a lot of the stuff Conor O'Shea's been doing or doing. But there is no nothing coming up through Wales. But nobody's nobody's calling for their relegation. Nobody's saying they should be out. I personally, personally think that Georgia should be invited into the Six Nations. And then my opinion got massively, massively changed when Italy absolutely smashed Georgia. <laughs> So, do you, do you know, it, it's like, you know, we're, we're, oh, yeah, Georgia, Georgia, you know, Georgia, they've got to come in. They've got to come in. Italy, go and do a number on them. Oh, um, yeah, Japan. Yeah, Japan, Japan. They've really definitely got to come in. But do you know what I mean? Well, I, I, yeah. I mean, I grew up in a day when it was the Five Nations. Wow. Uh, one's, thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> at, one, at one stage, it did drop down to four. But, uh, France were kicked out for a while because they were um, playing their, paying their players, I think, or or passing money under the table for a oh, while wow. when I'm it was not... still a, a um, oh, amateur game. So oh, for, a, for a short while there, okay, I was probably probably young, probably don't really remember, but um, but yeah, for a long time, it was the Five Nations. So so for it to become the Six Nations, when I was younger, that was a big, there was a, it, there was a lot of, you know, there was a big, you know, should it be? Who are these Italians? Should they mm. be involved in the game? Um, I enjoy watching them, to be honest with you. Yeah, so do I. Sergio yeah. Brice, you can't say anything else apart from the fact that he was one of the greatest. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, I, hope he, I hope he gets his farewell. Mm. I hope he gets his farewell. Mm. Just bring Especially him on. Especially with the weekends off, with the weekends off that they've now got oh, in okay. the mix of it. You, potentially, let's say you bring in, let's say you brought in one more team. I don't know that now that like, gives you six fixtures and people say, oh, that's a lot of strain without a week off. That's a lot of strain for a single squad. But, you know, it might mean some of the younger lads get a go. Because you know you have to run them out against Italy mm. or whoever, because mm. you can't have the same fifteen players going for eighty minutes mm. over six consecutive weeks. So does that grow a wider squad? Mm. How much does that help when you get to a World Cup? Like not very much at all. I wouldn't be against it growing. You know, forget about removing Italy, but mm. it becoming the seven nations with South Africa or whoever it may be. The um, I was in. I was in a, a pub, an unnamed pub, um, the other day. And um, there's this guy that we were talking, you know, we were having a general conversation about, you know, rugby and the you know, the Six Nations and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, if we brought in another team, you know, that'd be seven fixtures in a in one tournament. 
and I'm thinking to myself, now, I'm not very good at maths by any means, but I'm pretty sure they only play five fixtures at the moment now because you can't play yourself. And, <laughs> and it was the Six Nations, isn't it? That means they play six games. No, 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 because they only play five games because there's only five other teams. So if it went to the Seven Nations, they'd play six games. And I felt like really intelligent and really smart. But, um, <laughs> you showed him. Yeah, I showed him. I know my numbers. I know my maths. Good. So should we kick off this game? Kick off the first yeah, half. Very, very um, keen. Introduce sure. again, uh, Harry Bazalgette, uh, Cornish Irish, uh, sorry, Cornish Pirates, um, fly half. Uh, used to be here at Wimborne. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. Really good. So, um, you grew up in Inverness, yeah. is that correct? Or you were born in Inverness? Yeah, born in Inverness. I've grown up all all over the place, really. My dad's military, um, so you know the way it is, military life. You end up moving sort of every two years. Um, so I was born in Inverness, lived there for two years, then moved down to Dartmouth, which is sort of Devon way, and down near Plymouth. Uh, I was there for two years, did two years in London, um, and back up to Scotland for another two years. Um, to the States for two years and then I think my mum said that was it she was done moving and <laughs> we, ended up, we ended up settling um, down in Port and that's where I found Wimborne So is that when your rugby started when you got to Wimborne or did you played rugby on your yeah, trip? Yeah in fairness uh, rugby was sort of a constant for me which was nice so um, I started my first club was Harrow um, up in London so that was I think I'd been under fives that I started playing, classic tag rugby. Um, then I carried on, played for Kinloss when we moved back up to Scotland. Um, was there for four years. Um, sort of that's where I was introduced to contact and all that sort of stuff. I moved over to the States. Um, obviously there's no no rugby over there. Well, there's no there's no kids rugby. Um, I went along to a couple of training sessions like adult rugby, but how old were you? Yeah. I was 12 at the time. <laughs> um, and I bet you were still so, the best player on the pitch. <laughs> no, I'm not, mate, it was, I, I sort of went along and just kind of helped out. If I like, you know, pass balls in where I could, play scrum half, play the touch games, that sort of thing. Um, just to sort of keep my hand in and then joined Wimborne as soon as, as soon as we moved back to England. What, why, why was there no younger age groups? play rugby in America what, why was that yeah it just I don't think it had taken off I don't know I think where I was so we were in Virginia um, which I know even still is one of the places which is a bit further behind mm. um, I know at the time the nearest youth rugby club which I could have joined was up near Washington which was about four hours away absolutely um, mental yeah, so it was just, I think at the time, the game hadn't grown. I'd like to think it's different now mm. with how well um, the MRL is doing. Mm. And, you know, the national team and Sevens, which has come such a long way in the last 10 years since I moved away. Sevens, I think, suits the Americans. It's, um, you know, short, sharp, uh, full of explosive energy, etc. the sort of games that they play. Absolute athletes. Did you do any other sports in the USA? Uh, I played a lot of football, our football. I was going to say, is that, is that um, soccer or is that American football? A soccer. <laughs> um, and I did, I like for, I did one season of American football over there, um, but didn't massively get along with it. Uh, it was too stop start, um, and I didn't like that you only had one job. You know, I wanted to. I wanted to run with the ball as well as tackle people. Do but, anything, yeah, I remember. Yeah, but that wasn't a... So I went in, played a little bit at, they call it fullback, which is what it sounds like. So you're the last one in defence. Um, and then had a run at kicker. But yeah, lost interest and stuck to our football in the end. And that's why I played, you know, sort of weekends and for school and stuff while I was over there. Do you think that helped you with your rugby? Uh, definitely, I'd, I'd say definitely as far as the kicking and, you know, n now kicking is probably one of my super strengths and 
um, it's probably, in all honesty, it's probably the reason that I'm where I am now um, as far as scholarships um, with Exeter and then getting signed down here. Um, kicking's always always been something that I've sort of rested on and mm. been my point of difference. So, and yeah, undoubtedly that came from, you know, because I, I played football up in Scotland as well oh, okay. all the way through. It was a classic. I, I had rugby in the morning and then <laughs> run, home, one of those. run home, hair gel in, off to... <laughs> <laughs> Class. I'm not sure. Can you gel curly hair? Is that a, is that a thing? Oh, I'll send some photos <laughs> in front of the podcast. Class. <laughs> you have to straighten it first. So, Baz, when did you first probably get into? You know, you talk about them when you were like running to and from two different sports. When did you first get into rugby? <clears throat> first, get it. What? When did I decide that it was rugby? Well, when did you? No, no. When did you like first turn up at a club? Like, when did you go, you know, because the last thing you said is that you were playing scrum half for some senior team in America. When did you start playing rugby? So it was in Harrow. Harrow was my first club. At, um, under fives, I started. So I was four when I got there. And, you know, the classic ta- tag rugby. Um, was that then... you asked to go and play rugby or or was it something that was just on offer locally? or? Um, my, it was my, I think it was predominantly pushed by my dad. Um, but you know, it's something I was keen to do. Um, yeah. Growing up, like I loved sport. You know, if it was kicking a football against the garage or kicking a ball over the fence and pretending I was Johnny Wilkinson, like I was well up for it. Um, so yeah, as soon as I sort of had the opportunity to go along and play, I was I was dead keen. Um, I remember I then because I was there for two years, so I must have been six when we then moved to Scotland. And they start their contact a lot earlier. They don't do tag rugby in Scotland. Um, so I moved up there when I was six and they play full contact. Um, <laughs> so that that was, yeah, that, that was quite a transition for me when I was used to just, you know, normal tag rugby. I did not um, know that. That, that, is, so. that is awesome. Um, I'm going to move to Scotland then. Yeah, you have six, seven. I don't know if it's changed now. Um, but you had six, seven-year-olds. Yeah. Uh, trying to beat the haggis out of each other <laughs> that's, that's interesting because i understand that the southern hemisphere certainly new zealand play um weight related rugby yeah. rather than age related rugby yeah. so that they've got yeah. that ability to have contact at a you know safer contact perhaps at a, a more appropriate age yeah. um, to start <laughs> developing maybe that's why they they do so well yeah i think it's brilliant i think it definitely promotes sorry i'm probably going off piste a little bit but I, I love that idea of because I think a lot of kids get caught up, you know, and I, I was probably fell on the right side of it. But there was probably an age where I was one of the biggest, you know, one of the bigger, one of the stronger lads. Like I was about this size when I was about 16. You are, I but you are I was, mate, back when I back when I was playing number six. I've was, got Max over here shaking his head. And I've got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, tell me. And you know, <laughs> I've always been small and scrawny. <laughs> and... <laughs> I've never. Um, so me and Baz played together for three, yeah, three years. One at school, and then and then two at, uh, yeah, two at Colts in the end. And um, he, uh, I've never played with a ten who would just go hunting to end people left, right, and centre, or a ten that was a better <laughs> crash ball option than the eight. <laughs> he is not under exaggerating. He, he always punched above his weight and was always a bit of a bit of a monster. So yeah. I, I take it back. It's I'm only trying to wind you up, Paz. <laughs> but uh, what I'm what I'm tra- the point I'm trying to get to is I think for some of these bigger lads because they're bigger, stronger, a lot of like the softer skills of rugby sort of get put on the back burner. And you know sometimes you see some of the best rugby players are the ones that were smaller and had to develop their skills, develop their evasion. Those are the ones that ultimately, once they grow and sort of fill themselves out, they become the better rugby players in the end. So through necessity, they've really had to to develop skills that give them the edge rather than just lumbering in with a big load of bulk. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's why you know, like they do in New Zealand, when you're playing people, you know, it works both ways. When you're playing against people that are the same size as you you have to develop those rugby skills rather than just, you know, I'm small, therefore I'm not going to be very good at rugby or 
yeah. I'm massive, therefore I'm going to be great. The the amount of times that you know we've uh, walked past different clubs, you know, when we're on away games and stuff like that, and I hear youth coaches like shouting at you know a slightly bigger lad, you know, don't pass, carry, and he's just missed a three on one. Uh, and why are those skills not being developed? You know, look how excited everybody gets when you know someone like Carl Sinclair pulls out a worldy pass or or Ellis Genge or somebody like that, these big lads who have got great skills on them. You know, Baz speaks about, you know, his kicking, putting him above the rest. You know, big forward, you know, there's lots of big people around, but there's not many big people who have got good hand-eye coordination, good catch and pass skills that are going to be able to set them from the others. As far as skills go, mm. rugby players practice the basics daily because that's what the foundation is but where do you obviously you go to training i assume most days yeah is it always part basic skills and then working out perhaps tactics or or maybe the flair side of things where does the balance come for for you as an elite sportsman um no you definitely do um you know without fail the start of our backs unit so we are day run and you have sort of a backs unit session in the morning you have your gym meetings or whatever sort of in the middle of the day and then you finish with the team session um but without fail those you know the first 15 20 minutes of that backs unit session for us is you know short passes long passes pulling it out of the back you know it's basic hand-eye coordination standing in a circle um playing like little games, nothing overly complicated. Um, ball presentation, so just one-on-one -on -one fighting to the floor, just trying to build like good habits. Um, tackle tech, like not at a high pace, you know, like, like you see when you're introducing it to kids, you're just on your knees, getting your head in the right place, um, making contact with the right part of the body, all that sort of stuff. Um, now, the basics are so important. You basically, you want... For us, they talk about just building good behaviour. So it's more about being able to produce and reproduce those basics without having to think about it. So they are, they're just habits. You know, I don't think, or well, hopefully at this point, I don't, I don't think about my body weight transfer when I'm making a pass. Hopefully that just happens because every time I do it, you know, I'm practicing it. I'm thinking about it, and you get checked if you don't do it by one of the coaches or the other players around you, which help you out. So yeah, hundred percent. I think basics are are the foundation. Comes back to you know turning those techniques of a good, you know, a good pass into into a skill. You know, it becoming just natural that you just do it without without thinking. When for you, did you notice that actually? I'm not having to think so hard about my tackling, my passing, my kicking, and it's become a natural to me. You know, when when was that turning point for you? God, um, never really. You know, probably since once you come into a full time environment, and you know, like rugby is my everything. Like that's that that is all I I wake up and all my day is just rugby. Um. I guess what, what it allows you to do is the last thing I want to be thinking about when I was let's say I get the ball out the back and I've got a couple of options open to me. The last thing I want to be thinking about is, you know, how am I going to execute this pass? It just needs to be a case of, you know, what's the option and then a split second decision and then be able to execute without really thinking about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't really, I, I don't think I could really answer when that transition happened. I think it's something which just gradually comes with repetition, repetition. Just keep, keeps going. Awesome. Yeah. So it's amazing how much we do um, rely on uh, our habits daily, just um, opening the door or switching on a light, or that if you had to actually expend the energy to think about the process of doing it, you'd be exhausted within the first 10 minutes of opening your eyes in the morning if you just didn't have those habits um yeah. but it's stuff we did just take for granted um i know when we watch the youngsters out here at the academy um i don't think you quite understand until someone like yourself comes along and says actually the importance of just practicing 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 all the time 
actually hits home with the youngsters when they're out there trying to perfect that out of the backhand offload that they saw at the weekend um, mm. rather than just practicing those hands up in front of you, making a target, taking the easy pass, passing it on quickly, that sort of stuff. They want to do the exciting things that make them look great. Whereas actually what you're saying is, yeah, the most basic thing is just those passes. Worry about all the rest of it later. Once you get the habit formed, then you yeah. can worry about the audacious, flashy passes and skills, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, talk us through your, your, your goal kicking, because that's something that's become quite famous quite quickly after some of the stuff you were doing at Exeter Uni. And you- <laughs> And uh, I must admit, I mean, you know, even when we were we were playing down here and stuff like that, you know, it was always, you'd always back yourself to go for the pen. And, you know, we probably won countless games with your boot um, in many different ways. Talk us through your, your goal kicking. How long has it taken to you to get where you are with your goal kicking now? Uh, <laughs> a long time. Um, again, it's one of those basic skills, which, you know, the reality is, I probably only got to where I am because I spent an awful lot of time doing it. Um, pretty much as soon as we moved back from the States, um, it was quite an easy walk from my house up to the back of Caulfield's. Yeah. Um, and it's probably not an exaggeration that, you know, I'd probably got there two or three nights a week and probably hit 50 plus balls um, on that back pitch at Caulfield's. Um, crack and to be honest, pitch. It, crack and pitch. yeah, crack and pitch. Great memories on that pitch. Um, but to be honest, I I was obsessed with it, and I probably still am to in a, in a certain to a certain extent. Um, you know, I love routine. I'm quite I'm quite a keen golfer, um, and I yeah I draw quite a few parallels between the two of them. You know, routine, body weight transfer, the whole setup. Um, <laughs> it's going to sound quite nausy but you know it's something which I just loved and um, I used to because I think I was playing number eight or in the, usually in the back row back then sort of like under 13s under 14s and I remember always getting funny looks when it would be the number <laughs> eight would step up to do the goal kick in um, yeah I just you know I loved it and I spent hours doing it um, and it never I never really slowed down to be fair um, all the way through um, like, like I sort of said earlier I was always quite fortunate at being a little bit bigger um, so I kind of always had that slightly more natural range which you know under 13s it was quite rare that someone could probably consistently get to the sticks from the touchline but I was pretty lucky that I could um, and then when I got to uni uh, when, <laughs> uni was probably a massive turning point because it's the first time that I've really had any sort of professional kicking coaching. Um, so I did some work with Stu Allred. Um, I was with him twice a week, pretty much my whole four years there. And then in my last year, I was with Tony Yap, who um, they run the school of kicking and they're involved with quite a few um, big kickers. So they do like George Ford, Johnny Sexton, um, Bowden Barrett, James O'Connor. Um, they have them as sort of their students, as it were. Um, and that was the first time for me that I'd had professional, you know, before it was always trial and error. And, you know, I'd found something that had worked, but I didn't really know why. And, yeah. you know, if it went wrong, I didn't really know why. But, you know, you try again. And if it doesn't go wrong, that's great. Um, so for the first time, I was learning sort of the technicalities, you know, where's the best part of the ball to hit? What happened? You know, if this happens, why has it happened? Um, yeah. And then had a really well, quite a fortunate third year where the coaches put quite a lot of faith in me with my kicking. So we sort of changed our game plan from the typical X to go to the corner, back our, back our mall, back our scrum. It was much more, you know, if Baz is happy, then have a go. Um, racked up quite a few points in that last year, which ultimately put me on, hey. put me in the shop window for, yeah, which ultimately put me in the shop window for um, professional clubs. Did you have, did you have any other clubs interested in you? Um, I had no other professional clubs. No, I had a few sort of part-time um, Nat One clubs, but I I always wanted to 
you know, if the opportunity to be professional came up, I, I was always going to take that. Yeah. How did um how did you find you know talk us through that process because a lot of the you know the lads that I work with with the DPP uh, out here and stuff like that, a lot of them are like, well, how do I become a professional rugby player? How did it happen for you? Uh, how, how did it talk us yeah. through, like that that process? Who contacted you? What happened next? Where you are now? Yeah, so I was in my fourth year, so I'd gone back uh, post COVID. Um, I'd agreed, so I'd got a scholarship to stay on and do a master's at X T Uni. What were you studying? Sorry, I was doing finance and investment. Nice. Uh, I did maths. I did maths, pure maths, my undergrad. Um, but then COVID hit and decided to do a panic masters because um, I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> um, and so I'd gone back for pre-season. Uh, we've been back in for about six months and we just kept getting the announcements from Bucks and from the RFU, you know, oh, it's been pushed back. The start date was meant to be August. Oh, it's been pushed back to September. Oh, okay. Pushed back to October. Okay. Oh, it's going to start after Christmas. You think, okay, is this ever going to happen? Um, then we get to get to uh, Christmas and the RFU announced that Bucks Super Rugby wasn't, wasn't going to happen that year. Um, so there would be no there'd be no competitive rugby for any university sides, which is obviously a pretty massive blow because it's kind of the only reason I'd stayed stayed on to do the masters. Um, but then, luckily for me, so sort of going on in the background, um, the championship announced around the same sort of time that the championship season was going to go ahead, um, and it was due to start in February. Um, Cornish Pirates, I think, reached out to Chiefs. And asked um, if they had any sort of their academy fly halves that they could be released or you know weren't weren't in any of the chiefs plans post Christmas. And Hayden Thomas, who he's the the, the head of the academy at Chiefs, said um, they didn't have any fly halves on their books, but they knew of a fly half who just had a season cancelled. And um, if I fancied. If, I, if if they wanted to have a look um, so I got a phone call from Gavin Cattle who's the joint head coach down here um, he just rang me up sort of explained the situation and said would you like to come down on a um, two week trial because um, I think Hayden sort of vouched for me and said you know he's a good player but you might want to have a look at him first um, before sort of <laughs> pen, pen goes to paper so came down here on a two week trial Um and at the end of my fourth day, I got called up to the office and they were like, yeah, we'd really like to keep you on. Um, would you be interested in signing down here? How do so you react to that telephone call then when you get a call from a professional club that says, we want to take a look at you, you've been recommended? What goes through your mind? Oh, I was ecstatic. I, was, like, it, I, I hadn't expected it. Um, I didn't get a heads up from anybody. Um, yeah, I was, it was pure excitement, pure excitement. But you'd been working towards it. Yeah, it's always something which I hoped would be possible. Um, you know, and I always say in rugby, you've, you've got to back yourself because there's not many other people that will. Um, and I think for our sport in particular, compared to the likes of football, um, I think your main, your biggest fan sort of has to be yourself. And you have to believe that you can do it and you have to put yourself in the right positions to do it because it's not just going to happen for you. Um, yeah, there was obviously there was in the back of my head, there was the, you know, I haven't done it yet. You know, it's just a two week trial. Um, they could have very easily had me for those two weeks and gone, you know, thank you, but no, thank you. Um, Mate, to, for them to make their decision on day four of 14, you know, you must have been doing something right. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, honestly, mate, I was over the moon. Over the moon. So walk us through then your walk up to the office when you're called. What's going through your mind then when you're in that position where you've, you've got the phone call, you're ecstatic, you're in a position that you dreamed of, and then you get yeah. called to the office. I'm packing my bags, I'm going home. Yeah, they're sending me home early. Uh, to be honest, I didn't expect it. Um, you spend a lot of time with the coaches as well, like especially down here. And I imagine at most professional clubs, like it's, it is very hands-on. Um, the coaches are there. You review every training session, uh, one-on-one, you review 
training, all your games. Um, you know, I'm always going up, asking questions, coming up with new ideas, you know, sort of bouncing ideas off of each other. They call us up and say, oh, what do you think of this? Um, especially as like game managers, they call us like fly half, scrum halves, line out callers. Um, so I, to be honest, I didn't really think anything of it when he just said, oh, Baz, do you mind um, popping up after lunch or whatever? I was like, yeah, yeah, no worries. And then obviously he went up and he's like, um, yeah, we've seen everything we need to see. Um, we'd like to keep you on. And that was it. Uh, did you cry? Like in the office, did you cry or was it just like, yeah, yeah, yeah thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, I'm just going to head back down to the training now. See yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, me. I was, I was even me. I think I left. Probably rang my parents, rang my girlfriend. Said <laughs> you're moving to Cornwall, <laughs> which she loved. Uh, has that, <laughs> it's, I was just going to say to you, is Nancy living with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She moved down. Um, she moved down with me, which is lovely. That's brilliant. Good, good, good from her. Yeah, strong from her. Down the end, time, moving man. down to the end of the earth. Uh, you are proper end of the earth, aren't you, Mike? It is. Yeah. We are a couple of miles from Land's End. Yes, yeah, that is that is, that is good, that, unreal. Um, what talk us through your your week now? So now that you're so you did your two weeks, and then and then what happened after that? You did your two weeks, and it was into working your way into the match day squad, or was it straight away baptisms of a fire sort of thing? Talk us through your next steps. Yeah. Uh, well, it's panic stations trying to sort of flat and all of the move, the logistics of leaving, you know, we had a flight in Exeter, which needed to vacate. Um, I had to clear it with the university that, you know, I would only be remote. Um, so making sure that that was fine. Um, I had to clear it with the university sport staff because I was on a scholarship at the time. Um, oh, right. Then, oh. Yeah. So they'd help me they, out. They weren't playing any rugby. No, that's it. Honestly, they were so supportive. Oh, they right. were unbelievably supportive. Um, but, you think that would have been uh, different if the Bucks League had gone ahead? I, ima- I imagine so. To be honest, I, I'm i not sure it would have even, you know, I think it only really came about because I wasn't playing any rugby at the time, which is why my name was sort of thrown in the hat. Um, you know, potentially have COVID to thank for... Yeah, thank you, mate. Well, You've given me an hour positive that's come out of this pandemic that yeah <laughs> to many. so many people's dreams because of a pandemic That's yeah a, a, is a silver lining mate yeah um yeah to so panic stations and then yeah it was pretty it was pretty full on so that was beginning of february and i think by the time i was sort of came because i think i had a few days off to move and all that sort of stuff um the club sorted me in the end. They rented an Airbnb for me and Nance to live in for the season, which was ideal, which was lovely from them. Um, Clearly worth it. Yeah. And then I think three weeks after that, I was only in sort of full time as a player um, three weeks until we had that first Saracens game um, where I was named on the bench. I'm which... just going to jump in here for a second <laughs> before you carry on. It was... Probably every group chat that I was in that people were around from Wimborne, any sort of form of social media, when Baz got named as number 22, it absolutely exploded. And it everybody couldn't have been more proud of you, mate. And I was ecstatic for you. It was cancel all your plans. Um, we couldn't, couldn't get down to you, but did. Um, actually, were we even allowed to go and watch then? Not at that point. No. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Because... Uh, so we, um, I think so, I had smack next if you could organize a bus, yeah. <laughs> we, um, and then lots of people were buying. We, I had people over, we we bought, um, the like the, the championship membership thing for him to, to watch him. And it was, it was obviously a, a great game. Um, I'll, I'll pass back over to you now, Baz, to what actually went on on that day, yeah. So, um, against all odds, we ended up winning. Which, you know, for us, for us, like there was there was a weird buzz because um, we knew as soon as the, I think we only had about three weeks from when we knew that we had a game on the sixth of March, but we didn't know who it was going to be. Um, they sort of released the schedule and it's like you'll be home, you'll be away, but we don't know which teams yet. 
and I think it might it was like two or three weeks before. So fairly late, it was like you've got Saracens at home. Um, First game of the season. Yeah, hadn't played, you know, hadn't played in over a year um, at that point. Um, yeah, oh, it was phenomenal. It was unbelievable. Um, you know, Vincent Cock. <laughs> Honestly, like it was a pretty star Tim study. Tim, Tim Swimpson, um, Sean Maitland, like just to name a few. <laughs> yeah, it was mental. I I didn't get on the pitch, unfortunately, but right. it didn't stop me celebrating afterwards. I'll tell you that. Not. Mate, just to be named in that squad. Oh yeah, we have got you know. Let's be honest, you know they. If the world of rugby, you know, if they hadn't done what they'd done, they'd never be in that situation. They weren't there because they were poor. They were there because they were too good. Um, yeah, and for you know, from an outside perspective, a little old small local club with awesome mm. kit, awesome chat, good social media stuff, just turned over a double European and premiership champion team. Like it was just amazing. It was amazing to watch. Obviously I was massively gutted you didn't get on, but it sort of took that away from it. It was, he has just been involved in that and, that all... yeah, it was great to be a part of, regardless. Like, even if I wasn't in that match day squad, just being part of the training week and, you know, I, oh, mate, it was huge. It was massive. It would have been, we, we probably have the Six Nations to thank that quite a few of the England lads weren't there. If we'd have had the Elliot Dalio and Farrell, Maruatoji, might have been a different story. But that nah, was a, it was one of those days that I'll remember. And for it to be my, you know, effectively my debut is, you know, cherry on top. But like you said, the the training, the lead up, the support, the warm ups, all that sort of stuff goes towards a win. So yeah. on the bench in that shirt, watching your teammates succeed is is got to fill you with with a real sense of achievement. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I know it's easy to say when you're not when you're not playing, but you know we see it down here all the time. Like any result we get, you know, it's a result of everything that's been done that week. Whether you were part of the, one of those boys that was running the opposition sets all week but you were running them at 100% and preparing the team for the weekend like you you have an equally as valuable job as the guy that's going to step up and take that last kick to win the game potentially so that's, that's brilliant yeah. and then moving on forward then after when did you get when did you get your obviously you were in the match day squad but when did you first become a pirate when did that first happen for you so the next week, so we had Richmond away that next week and that was my champ debut. Um, I think we got about 20 minutes in the end, which I was really happy with. Um, I think we were winning when I came on. We ended up winning quite comfortably. Got my first champ points as well. Yes. yes. Last kick, which was brilliant. Yeah, and then had my initiations on the bus on the way back, which probably shouldn't speak too much about. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll glaze straight over that. I'm not even going to bother yeah. asking you. Um, that was good fun. What? Okay, so you've then gone from when did you get your first start? When did you get your first start at ten for Pirates? Uh, I had to wait. So I got my first start about four weeks ago. Um, so I think it worked out. It was it was exactly a year since I first came down for that trial period. Wow. Um, was the first time I actually got to put that 10 shirt on I think yeah I think I've I think I had 20 I think I had 20 odd appearances but all of those being from the bench um so yeah it was nice to and it being at home as well so getting to run out with that 10 shirt on it was that was pretty special um talk us through you know did it you know I hear a lot of people you know they, they get upset you know myself included about you know not being in that top team and that starting 15 did you struggle with with being on the bench a lot um did i struggle i think it's oh it's tough it's the the competitor inside of you and i think if you're gonna get if you're gonna make it to this level there's got to be part of you which is just unbelievably competitive um you know, that part of me is sort of burning every time you see the team sheet and whether your name's on it or, you know, whether you're travelling reserve or, you know, you're not involved at all. Um, but then, you know, I I think I always try and dust myself off pretty, pretty quickly and say, look, if you'd have told 15-year-old Baz 
that he's going to be playing professional rugby. He's going to wake up every day, go to training. Um, he's going to be travelling all over England playing, you know, these various players from various clubs, I'd say. I'd bite your hand off. So, you know, there there is that initial, you know, there's something in the background which is like, God, you know, I'd love to be starting, but, you know, I've got a job to do. And if I'm not starting, then fair enough. And, you know, it's up to me to make sure that the boys are as prepared as they can be, the starters are as prepared as they can be for the week and, you know, make sure that if, you know, if I come on five minutes into the game or 20 minutes into the game that I'm ready to do whatever, whatever needs to be done. Brilliant. That is awesome, mate. Awesome. I think we'll look at um, stopping for half time just there. Um, we've got a few announcements to make, um, not least... Um, about the uh, to dwell too much on the horrendous things that are going on in the world at the moment, but um, Wimborne Rugby Football Club, as well as so many um, people across Britain and probably the world, are trying to do their best to try and help um, the refugees that have been displaced from um, from Ukraine. Um, and Wimborne have opened their doors thanks to um, Smacks will be here. Um, available to take any donations um, for the refugees to help out where they can. Items that have been asked for are nappies, baby wipes, canned food, cereal bars, baby milk in it, premix cartons, toothbrushes, toothpaste, face wipes, sanitary products, hairbrushes. Um, if anybody's got the ability to spare, donate, have anything that they can bring down to the club, the club will do their best to package them all up and get them to people that are in need. Anything else that's um, perhaps needs announcing? We've got um, uh, Litch at Sevens. Yep. Litch at Sevens. Um, so they've said they are... What What weekend are they doing that on now this week? Uh, I, think it's the, I think it's the 10th. Let me just check. Yeah, so Litch Sevens have got their their stuff open for their uh, men's, ladies, most age groups. I think the youngest they do is under 15. Is that right? Am I right in saying mm, that? I think so. Um, but yeah, any clubs in, in any area, to be honest with you, they're always looking for people and get get on the, down onto their website, have a look at Litch Sevens. It's a brilliant tournament. I've played in it. I've drank in it. It is a it's an awesome tournament. Um Baz, were you in that team that we won, Litch at Sevens? Were you in that team or was that the year that you left? I was, I think that might have been the year. I, I was, my last Litch at Sevens was the year when the final was Wimborne versus Wimborne. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, no, you, were, you were in that one then. Were you in the Wimborne winning team that won that one? No, it was not. No. That's tough. That is, that is tough, tough to take. What really the, dates dates? the dates are 29th and 30th um, of April and 1st of May. Awesome. There you go. Honestly, cannot, wherever you're listening, um, make it an international tour, uh, make it a big tour down, wherever it is, uh, get on it, get involved in that tournament because it is, it is brilliant. It's a great sevens tournament, great local sevens tournament that um, is growing and growing all the time. Good, um, good support for local grassroots rugby as well. Massively, massively. I think that's all. There's not too many. Um, after that, then we'll go on to the second half. This is where, Baz, we'd like to talk to you about um, what rugby means to you. So I suppose we start off with that question. What does rugby mean to you? Oh, rugby to me. God, I think for a long time, rugby, rugby was sort of my everything, really. Um, as I sort of mentioned I moved around a lot growing up um, sort of moved every couple of years so you sort of you lose you know I didn't really have like a best friend growing up because you'd sort of you'd settle in but just as you sort of got comfortable it was you were off again um, so I guess the rugby club was always somewhere which I felt comfortable um, and somewhere where I automatically sort of met People, I know you obviously have school, but people with similar interests um, and, you know, it was an easy first thing to do, you know, fancy going down to the club and 
doing some goal kicking, for example. Um, a bit of home away from home. Yeah, no, it definitely was. Um, you know, and similarly, going to university, you sort of turn up, you don't know anyone amongst 21,000 students, but you get yourself down to the rugby club and you suddenly got 300 lads with similar interests. And, you know, I'm sure you guys will vouch 99.9% of people involved with rugby are usually pretty good blokes. So, um, yeah, that's what rugby has sort of given me. And throughout uni, it gave me like a focus as well. Um, probably stopped me going out too much. Probably made me go out. I was just going to say, surely it makes you go out more. <laughs> yeah, but at the right time, I guess, you know, when you had a six o'clock gym session or a seven o'clock team session up at the crumb, the last thing you wanted was to be off your head dancing around God knows where at three o'clock in the morning before. So what what Baz would you be if it wasn't for rugby? God. Um I think I'd be boring a... bloke, awful chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd have nothing. You'd have nothing without rugby. All of the above, yeah. Rugby gives me everything. <laughs> um God, I don't know. That's a really hard question. I think I'd be a lot bigger than I am now because I've got a big appetite for food. And I think the only reason I'm not the size of a house is because I'd somehow burn it off. Um, that's a really hard question. Do you do you feel that it was a bit of a release for you? You know, you talk about it as a uh, as a bit of a focus, but you know, I can't comprehend constantly moving around and stuff like that. Would you say it was a bit of a a release for you? And if you didn't have that release, what would what would you have turned to? What would you have gone to? Um, if I'm honest, I think just because of the person I am, I think if it hadn't been rugby, it probably would have been something else. Um, like I sort of said, I, I love my football. Um, I, I loved all sports, really. But in the end, when I had to choose, rugby was the winner. Um, yeah, I think if, if it wasn't for rugby, you know, I've always been quite active. Um, like sort of even throughout COVID, you know, I found CrossFit and all that sort of stuff to try and keep me keep me busy. So I'd like to think that I wouldn't be too different without rugby, but you know, you can't I can't play down, you know, how much it really did enrich me growing up and expose me to good people, new friends. Um, like you say, almost sort of like a home away from home when we were moving so often. Was it was it ever when you were younger um, your intention to become professional or was it just about playing rugby and enjoying the game? Yeah, I'd never... It was a dream, but I never thought it was possible, if I'm honest. Um, I'm probably like more of a late developer. Like I was never picked up by any of the academy stuff or... You know, I didn't play Dorset and Wilts until I was 18 and I got picked up for the under 20s. Um, but, you know, I went through the trials and stuff and it was always like, nah, nah, nah. Um, you know, I think part of when I got to university, um, you know, I rocked up to trials and I think I, I initially got put in like the fifth team or something like that. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of started playing and got moved up to the sort of the thirds I think first and then ended up playing for the twos in my second year and then eventually got my first team spot um, everything kind of happened quite slowly and I think it always has like like I said with the Dorset and Wilt stuff the under 20s I think I was involved in like training camps and it took them a while it took a while for me to actually get any minutes with them um, yeah I always like I, if you'd have told me I was going to be professional I probably wouldn't have believed you um just because everything, I feel like everything sort of progressed probably at the right pace for me because I felt like everything was like a small step in the right direction. Mm. Um, I'd say it, I'd never felt it was a genuine possibility probably until my third year at university when I sort of had whispers from a few, like a few professional clubs and I was like, whoa, like <laughs> had sort of agents approaching me and that sort of thing. You just said step in the right direction. Is that a step that you consciously took or was that just something you were going along with were you 
were you going with the flow or were you driving yourself to get to the next step? Um, probably a bit of both. Um, I'd say the main, like I sort of said, the main reason I ever played rugby was because I loved it. You know, it, it was never, my parents were never dragging me up to training sessions or anything like that. Like I loved every game of rugby I ever played. Um, and I think, you know, I only really played, like I said, I, I joined up the university rugby club just because I thought I might meet a few, a few lads and, you know, I did ultimately. Um, a few of them would be like best mates for the rest of my life. Um, as far as a step, you know, th there was a conscious part of me and it's probably the competitive side of me that, you know, I, I didn't miss a gym session. I never missed training. Um, you know, that probably wasn't with the intention of because I'm going to be a professional athlete. I think that was just, I think that was just sort of in my DNA. It wasn't something, you know, it wasn't something that I consciously did in order to become professional. It was just sort of who I am. I was, I was never going to miss anything like that. There's a, um, uh, a lot of psychology around um, uh, the feeling um, that you get from heading towards a goal, um, mm. more so the journey towards it than it is uh, achieving it. Your body produces, um, you know, uh, good feelings when you're doing something positive towards a goal. Mm. And I think sometimes um, people set goals that are probably too big, too daunting, and they stop traveling towards the goals. It sounds to me perhaps like you were more, your goal was get up in the morning and hit the gym, have a good session so that you yeah. feel like you've achieved something. Would that be about right rather than the becoming a professional rugby player goal? Yeah, definitely. Like it was never, you know, like I never wrote down. I probably never even told anyone, you know, I'm going to be a professional rugby player. There's nothing you can do to stop me. I'm going to get up at this time. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to hit this many goal kicks on a Tuesday and Thursday night after training. Like it was never really like, it was never like that. I went to rugby because I loved it. And my best mates were down at Wimborne and, you know, Jay, like I'd turn up and I'd be with Tatey, be with Gibbo. And it was just, I, I loved, I loved every part of rugby growing up, the social side, the, playing side like Jay said I used to love the physical side of it like it probably was an element of it being a release um, yeah I just uh, def definitely I'd agree with you know you do feel good when you do those things but for me it was never it was never a journey from like A to B it was just I was out for a Sunday stroll and sort of see where I end up with no real you know if I'd have finished university you know, and that had been the end of my rugby journey and I'd have come home, got a job and been playing for the first team at Wimborne. I I'd have, I think I'd have been equally as fulfilled by that from a rugby sense as I am now, if that makes sense. That's that's interesting because I think um, I was listening to something today um, about um, the mindset that people, high achievers, have when they've achieved their goal to the point where they set out to achieve a goal, they've achieved it, um, they've done everything they can. They get to a point where they feel unfulfilled because they've got where they're going. There's nothing more to achieve mm. um, rather than taking each day as it comes and say, today, I want to do that. Go and do that. And tomorrow I'll worry about tomorrow and there'll be something else uh, yeah. after that to, to do. So smaller, smaller gold sets and enjoying what you're doing at the time. Uh, yeah. A lot of people miss out on in the enjoyment of achieving at the gym one day because they're too worried about something bigger in the future. Yeah. No, no, I, I completely understand that. And I think, I think because I never planned for it and I never really expected it, like I said, it all kind of came round pretty quickly for me. Everything at this point is like, it's just a bonus. You know, the fact that I'm able to do this and I didn't go the, down the normal route of getting a grad job and, moving to London or whatever my path could have been, you know, this is a bonus. And if I stay on next year and, you know, hopefully pull that 10 shirt on a few more times, um, you know, that's a bonus again. If 
another club comes along and says, do you want to come and do what you're doing with us? You know, Billy bonus. And if it doesn't, I'm not going to throw my toys out of the pram. I'll just say I had an absolutely wicked two years down with Cornish Pirates, living the dream. Now it's time to get a real job or something like that. So if I offered you about, let's say, five pints a month, would you come and play for Wimbledon? God, that's more than one here. <laughs> <laughs> so can I just ask you, while you were at uni, you were the Oddballs ambassador. Yeah. Um, how come you got involved in that? Was that just somebody asked you to be, or was it something you had a, an interest in, you wanted to be part of? or? Yeah, so... Um... I knew it was a role that you could apply for. So the guy before me was leaving um, and I knew that the role was going to be vacant. So I approached him and just said, you know, is there any chance, you know, how, or how do I go about applying for it sort of thing? Um, cancer is something that's fairly personal to me. It's, you know, there's multiple cases of it in my family. Um, lost a couple of family friends, uh, my nan, uh, she's well she's still sort of battling on and off um with it she's all clear at the moment but it's already come back twice um yeah it's something which you know it's affected me quite a lot growing up um and you know I'm, I'm I was acutely aware of who Obbles were the importance of the you know the work that they do and I just thought I'm quite happy speaking you know speaking to people um, sharing my thoughts and if there was an opportunity for me to you know spread the message and you know, if, if we've got time we're going to work the work that they do and that sort of thing but if there, if there was anything I could do that could you know alleviate some of the stress which I had been through growing up with family members and friends going through and fighting the disease then for me that's something I really want to get involved in. Okay. Tell us man. Tell us about um, the sort of stuff they do. Yeah, so um, Oddballs are they're a, they're a charity, um, and their main aim is basically just raising awareness um, of testicular cancer among young men, well, and women, everybody. Um, it's typic testicular cancer is typically not spoken about as much as other forms of cancer, um, despite it being one of the easiest to treat and very easy to diagnose or like pick up yourself. Um, so basically what they wanted to do was get as many people talking about it. Um, they wanted ambassadors in universities, going out to schools, speaking to kids, um, speaking to clubs, rugby clubs, and basically getting young men checking themselves regularly because it's one of those diseases where the longer you leave it, you know, the less chance you have of fighting it. So the more regularly you check and the sooner you pick it up, the, you know, the greater chance you have of, of beating it. And I think if you, if you catch it early, the chance of beating it is, you know, I think there's a 99 point something percent. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit rusty. I haven't done the role for a year, but <laughs> 99 point something percent chance of you um, coming out of it at the right end. So yeah, I, as soon as there was an opportunity for me to go in and speak to kids and spread the message, I was, I was dead keen. So um, uh, an old friend of mine um, had testicular cancer when he was in his very early 20s. Yeah. And I always remember him telling me, he's fine, by the way. Um, I always remember him telling me that when he went to the doctors, he went very early. He mm -hmm. realized one of, his, uh, one of his testicles had gone hard. He yeah. went straight to the doctors within, I think, probably a week or so. Yeah. Um, and he was talking to other men in the waiting room um that were back really really poorly with it mm. um and i remember him saying to me after obviously he'd been through his you know his his battle with it um that some of the guys that he was talking to there that were very very poorly and i don't know whether they survived he doesn't know whether they survived but it looked like they were were struggling with it had yeah. sat with the knowledge that there was something odd downstairs mm. or the best part of six months before going to the doctors. 
Crazy, um, isn't it? And he said, if I can let anybody know, first chance you get if you think there's any problem with your testicles, just get to the doctor straight away. Yeah. Well that's well that's it. And you know, I was probably guilty of it for a long, a long time. You just always thought that cancer was something that happened to, you know, older people. It wasn't something that we had to worry about. But you know, cancer uh, testicular cancer is the most common form of cancer amongst 14 to 39 year olds like that's us well that's me certainly that's you jay right, right. and like <laughs> yeah that was um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> um but i just don't think it's something that really people don't really think about and they don't associate it as an issue that an issue for them but you know it is and it is serious um but like you say just by checking regularly and picking it up sooner you know, the chances of it being a serious life-changing issue um, is serious, ser- significantly reduced. It's, it's brilliant, isn't it? You know, when I go into local rugby clubs and stuff like that, and, you know, even in, not even rugby clubs, in different bars and stuff like that, and I see that awesome blue and pink poster on the back of a, a door and stuff like that, it's like, when you go home, have a play with your balls and see if there's anything wrong. And if there is anything wrong, this is what you do. And I just think that it, it is just, it's just brilliant. You know, you think how many lives that just those posters have saved it it is just it's phenomenal isn't it you know and then what's even better is they do some unreal stash some unreal (laughs) stash i don't own a a, a pair of boxers that isn't oddballs you know that is i'm a fully subscribed member absolutely love it and they the work they do is just is just amazing it's just amazing beauty so your willingness to get involved in that obviously is because your family um has suffered with um with cancer yeah. um obviously we're looking at a hat here rugby hat oddballs all about rugby rugby's promoting it as as best it can do mm-hmm. um there's so many people out there that wouldn't get involved with that sort of stuff even if they have had issues with cancer do you think and our philosophy is rugby is all about teamwork you're there to help those around you you know whether it's on the pitch or whether it's in the clubhouse or whether it's on the street or whether it's at home do you think that philosophy from rugby has pushed you to be more involved in that sort of a thing uh definitely i think so um i've always tried and you know it probably came partly from the obbles role and because obbles as well they they uh, work with some mental health charities and that sort of thing um, and it was quite relevant around the time when I was taking on the role, it was just post COVID, but just the whole, like checking up on each other, having, being able to have a conversation with your mate. Um, I know there's this, you know, this big persona, if you're a rugby player, you, you know, you bash chests and go and sink a beer together, but you know, it's, it's so important. And like I said, a lot of my best friends came from rugby and being able to, you know, go to them if you have an issue or knowing that when you turn up on a Thursday, you know, if, if there is something in your personal life or you're struggling with something or, you know, you might have a question around what is it, fit? do your testicles have a lump on it? You know, what should I do if one of them has gone slightly firm? Do you, do you remember those posters that we saw in Spoons? Do you remember what it said I should do? Or something like that. Um I think rugby is quite unique in that sense because I think the majority of clubs that you go to and at least teams that I've been involved in, I'd like I'd like to think, you know, those conversations are had. I don't know if you feel the same, Jay. Oh yeah. Oh ma- massively. You know, it's uh you know, you think about, you know, that change of environment and stuff like that, you know, just wanna I want as many people around here to as live as long as possible as they possibly can and to do something mm. so simple like that to have those conversations to break down that awkward oh um i need to have a look at my testicles later do you know it, to break that down just go have you done that you know you know mm. have you got that sort of you know you've been cl- you've been complaining of a few aches and stuff like that at training you know have you gone and get that checked out have you been checking yourself and stuff like that it's it, it is brilliant and i the admiration i have for you for going out there and and doing that stuff you know we were trying to organize you coming into to the college I work at and stuff like that. And, you know, COVID was an absolute nightmare in the end. And, but you you just, it was brilliant. You know, how keen you were and everything like that, the stuff you were doing on social media, 
he got a wicked car out of it as well. And, you know, massive admiration for what you did, mate, because those amount of conversations you were going around having it is, is just brilliant. Well done on you, mate. Cheers, mate. Hopefully it made the difference. And even if it made the difference for one person. It's right? worth it, isn't it? Just it's one worth person's it. worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the we talk about the mentality in a, a rugby club, like a grassroots, like um, Wimborne Rugby Football Club, the club. Um, does that friendship, camaraderie, um, uh, that wanting to be a brother to the guy or a sister to the guy next to you, does that continue into professional rugby when you're at Cornish Pirates? Do you get that same feeling that you get when you're in a grassroots club? Uh, yes, from my experience, definitely. Um, I think potentially from stories I've heard, um, I think Pirates is quite unique. Um, I think geographically, um, it's obviously you quite are unique. on your own. <laughs> yeah, and I and I think that makes obviously a slight. I think that does make a slight difference to how close we are as a unit. Um, you know the other team which we're sort of compared to is Jersey in a sense, you know, stuck on an island. Um, but being down here, you know, we really do only have each other. Um, a lot of the lads moved down. So like me, you know, family are back, you know, four hours away back in Dorset. Um, if you, if you ever need anything, it's, it's them that you call for. It's not, you know, you're locked out. You know, I had a mate, one of the boys was locked out of his flat last night because he lost his key. And he came and spent the night round here because he he lives down the road. Um, obviously, boys are sort of. I know it's the same anywhere, but it's the first time I've really experienced it. Going from you know junior rugby to university, coming to Pirates is the first time that all the lads are sort of at different points in their life. So you've got me fresh out of uni. Um, you've got. Uh, this lad called Kinger, who's fresh out of college, his first year in professional rugby, and he's absolute carnage. Um, and then you've got, you know, our captain who is expecting a baby, he's bought a house. Um, you've got other older lads that are, you know, their mid 30s and got two kids, a wife and a dog. Um, you know, that's, oh, I think I've lost you guys. Uh, we can still hear you, but you've frozen. And uh, welcome back to the uh, Be More <laughs> Rugby part, Podcast Part 2. Uh, due to it, technical difficulties, um, we have lost Baz. Uh, we've found him again, but he's in a different location. He's been kicked out of his missus' office. Um, where are you now, Barry? Um, I'm in bed. <laughs> You're in bed. Lovely. We'd love to see it, mate. That's continuity for you. There you go. You look mate. more comfortable. <laughs> you certainly do. What is that draping behind you, Baz? Uh, this is a piece of Mummy Baz's artwork. Oh, Jane, that is amazing. Look at that. Wow. Right. What, what is it? Um, macrame, they call it. Oh, wow. It's, yeah. For our it goes for off our... a Cornish, Cornish house. Very nice. So she's... Well, For our listeners that um, aren't on video and are only on audio, um, he's shown what I can describe as an awesome bit of carpet on the wall. Well done. <laughs> well described. Well Jane, done. Jane would like that. <laughs> so apologies for that. We lost connection. Um, uh, we were part way, best way part through our second half. Um, we were discussing rugby, how it's, um, what it's meant to you really. Um, just wanted to, to see, obviously, you're just starting, hopefully, your professional career, many years to come, I'm sure. When you move on from your professional career and hang up your boots, what do you hope to take with you from rugby onwards? Um, wow, another really good question. Um, I think something which I will take is... I'll take a lot of, or quite a few friends. Um, like we touched on earlier, I think rugby clubs and the rugby environment and being part of a team gives you ability to, you know, make friends, which I don't think you would make elsewhere. Um, you know, it's a different kind of bond, isn't it? Um, 
I'd say probably, I think that competitive edge, I think will stay with me sort of no matter what I do, um, whether I go into an office job and, or a sales job or, you know, wherever, wherever I end up, wherever I end up, I think that competitive spirit or is probably something that will stick about. Um, I don't know, it's going to sound really cliche, but probably just that never say die attitude, which I think rugby sort of instills in you. Um, you know, at no point is it over um, until until someone says it's over. I think that's that's probably one of the biggest ones I've learned, probably since coming in here. Um, I don't know, for anyone that keeps up with Cornish Pirates, um, we've got an unbelievable ability to come back from um, deficits and steal it at the end or well, we have done in the last few weeks well to be two games in hand and second in the, the table um, show some resilience there has to be some resilience there yeah no, definitely definitely there's no easy games in this league um, you know this year I think more so than even in the past um, the ability for bottom of the table to beat mid-table teams for top of the table to go and lose to seventh um, seems to be all over the place and I think that's why we're now seeing a really really tight you know top of the type top of the table race going into these last uh, two rounds for some of the some of the teams does that drive you on a bit more when there's a a bit more of a a race at the top a bit more of a challenge absolutely um you know, Pirates have said uh, for as long as they've been professional, so 20 odd years, they've never been in this sort of position or, you know, never, but never been in a position where winning it is, you know, arguably in our hands. Um, obviously, we still need to play top of the table and third um, in, the, in the coming three weeks, um, which are going to be massive, massive fixtures for us. Um, but, you know, ultimately it's in our court and, um, it's there for us to there for us to take if we want it. Baz, um, we've spoken a lot about you as a as a pro rugby player and stuff like that and your journey journey there. Um we had Smacks on last week and obviously I'm involved in Wimborne, James is involved in Wimborne, you have been involved in Wimborne and stuff like that. Um yeah. and this isn't a, a Wimborne rugby club podcast. It is a is a is a be more be more rugby podcast but my question would be is can I take you back to when you were playing your rugby here what was that like talk about the grassroots stuff talk about the stuff that led you to where you are now yeah me it was exceptional all the way through um when I first arrived I remember it being very inclusive um as like did you you start here at Wim? when yeah, what what age group were you when you started here? Under thirteens. Okay. I joined. Um, but I remember it being, you know, extremely welcoming, um, friendly, enjoyable. Obviously at the same time my brother joined the younger age group. Um, so for those first few months when we moved back from the States, it was that was our weekend. Um, you know, on a Saturday we'd come down, watch the first team boys, and then on a Sunday it was it was our turn to follow suit as it were um but then all the way through you obviously go up to Colts and you know I don't know anything different so you might say it's the same at every club but I used to love turning up to Colts and having senior players there coaching you same as sort of under 16s you turn up and I remember being I was taught how to jump um and line out lift and stuff by Kinger and Deck um which, you know, for me, when I'd grown up watching them tearing up on a Saturday, they were these big blokes that you sort of looked up to and then they're suddenly or, you know, they're there coaching you, teaching you how to do it. And then, you know, only two years after that, once you're 18 and you're involved with Colts, it's, you know, they're taking you out into Wimborne and the more social social side of it, which, you know, I've, I thought was brilliant, you know, as an 18-year-old. Um and then again, the transition with those blokes that have, you know, followed you, encouraged you, handed down their wisdom. Um, I remember when I got my my debut for the Wimborne first team, um, and you know those boys were there. So you had like Moisey, 
um, Ryan Maidman, uh, Kinger, Deck. And I just remember thinking, like, this is wicked. <laughs> Mate, they, were, they were thinking exactly the same thing. Thank God we've got somebody else who can do the running around now. <laughs> yeah, potentially. <laughs> um, as obviously we, you know, getting a bit, you know, personal, you know, we are, well, you know, it's been thrown around that we're more than friends and stuff like that. And, you know, I'd, I'd, like, <laughs> to, I'd like to encourage those rumours as much as possible. But, um, <laughs> You know, first time I met you was was here and everybody spoke how highly of you, you know, that awesome lad that's got a body like a like an eight but plays at ten and with that awesome curly hair do you had with the, the full afro stuff and then obviously we went to school and I'm pretty sure looking back at you know, I'll tell you exactly what when I was in year eleven and you were in sixth form, um, the rest of my year sat there mass paper one GCSE exam. And where was I? out on the sports field, chucking American football around with you and the guys and stuff like that. And, you know, that, that was, uh, that, well, you know, it all worked out well in the end, didn't it? But you know, <laughs> I, I thought, you know, you've been such a brilliant person for me. Obviously you were my captain when I came into my first year of Colts. Um, you were the captain here and that, and, you know, we've had a, a great relationship, stayed in touch loads and stuff like that. And your evolution as a, yeah, yes, as a player, obviously, you know, you were, or it was always a lot easier playing playing when you were on the field. Um, but as a bloke, your your development has been, you know, has, has, has been massive. And I think that's only going to continue to go. You know, I've, everybody here keeps a massive close eye on you and stuff like that. And, you know, with the stuff with Exeter Uni and then with Oddballs and now with the Pirates and stuff like that, you know, uh, you're a top bloke, mate. And you should really, really be, you know, proud of yourself and it's been a genuine awesome experience in my life you know I think back to those times on tour you know we were speaking with Smacks and James last week about our best memories in rugby and mine will be that the half tour that we went to Uh, I was speaking to Will Tate about that the other day and I said because he I don't know if you remember but he didn't come yeah yeah uh, yeah, I've got my exams yeah I I can't come I was like you missed out on probably one of the best, well, I'll hold that as one of the best weekends of my life. Yeah. Man, that was amazing. <laughs> what is your leading on to that? There was a point to my brown nosing. Uh, I got to, that was it. What is your best memory <laughs> in, doing that. In, in, in rugby? My best memory in rugby? That is, there's so many. Like you say, there are so many. There's the, <laughs> you obviously have the memories of you playing um, you, a playing moment or a club tour moment or yeah let's have, let's have one of each one of each okay it's so hard I know I don't I honestly don't think I can I've got so honestly so many good memories the last the last game that I ever played as a Colt for Wimborne um, up at North Dorset we played against Chippenham yeah um, I remember that as you know that sort of end of an era um, last last game as sort of an under eighteen. Um, a couple of those games which we played when we toured South Africa with school. Um, a couple of those, you know, really fond memories of that. Um, the varsity fixtures at Exeter University were, you know, wicked. Um, for me, some of the first time playing in front of, you know, four thousand people, which was pretty crazy when you're not when you're used to playing in front of, you know, hardly anybody. Um, <laughs> and then what about your, you know, the, the proper stuff, the proper rugby stuff? Uh, so my first team debut for Wimborne, obviously. Nice, nice. Proper rugby. Um, and mate, any, there's so many. Any, any so scores many. or any, like, weekends away or anything like that, the off-field stuff? Uh, end of season dinner here was pretty wicked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Most, most most Wednesday nights um, back at uni. Yeah. Um, again, probably shouldn't speak about them on here. Yeah. Probably in the right place. Um, mate, so many. I think like like I sort of touched on because because I've had quite a gradual, you know, journey. It's never been. I've never sort of just been thrown in and you know people back and said you know this is going to be whatever, yeah. whoever. 
everything has always almost felt a bit like you know I've reached it like yeah yeah this is amazing because I, I never really expected it. Like I said, the first time I ran out for the Wimborne First team, I've been watching them growing up. Like it was a really special moment. And at the time I was probably equally as proud as the first time, the first varsity fixture that I ran out at Sandy Park or the first start that I had down here as a Pirates fly half. Um, I think because it just, because it builds and it builds, I think, yeah, they equally as fond of all of those memories. Mm. Awesome. Very conscious of the time. I think um, that probably is going to need to wrap up our second half. Um, Baz, it's been an absolute delight. Um, I think for me, some of the things that I'll take away from this are just things that you've said, like the never say die uh back yourself that sort of thing that can be passed on to anybody whether they want to become a professional rugby player sportsman whatever they want to be but those that those lessons that give you the ability to move forward in life from childhood to adulthood to from adulthood to senior age um good memories you've talked about pride you've talked about um rugby giving you a focus um, a home away from home, that sort of stuff. Um, mm. It's been an absolute pleasure and and so nice to talk to you. What a guy, um, really. Um, it's uh, it's one of those opportunities you get to speak to somebody that's made some real success um, and to give us the ability to pass it back to the lads that are here in, and the girls that are here in uh, in the rugby club, in the academy, um, and the ones that are here looking upon you, saying, you know, well done, congratulations, and all feeling like they've succeeded a little bit with you. Um, no, I always, yeah. always say that um, success is being able to watch somebody else go over the try line, but being able to celebrate with them in the knowledge yeah. that you contributed. Absolutely. No, I really appreciate that. I guess, you know, the whole way through, I've always been very conscious of the support that I've had, you know, particularly from Wimborne and the people from like the whole journey, you know, like Dorset and Wilkes coaches that still message you, school PE teachers that you get a message for the night before your first, um, the first start. Like it's, it's, it's nice when you're reminded of how many people are actually rooting for you. Oh yeah. Everybody um, is, you are uh... You are a legend and, um, mate, lovely to speak to you. Uh, miss seeing you loads, mate. And so, so honestly, mate, couldn't be happier for you. All well-deserved. And for a lot of us, it was never in doubt. It was always known that that's where eventually you'd, you'd end up, mate. Um, awesome to listen to you speak, mate. Um, yeah, lovely to see you, mate. And I'll, uh, I'll catch you soon, man. Yeah, appreciate that. Just before we wrap up, um, the was a halftime announcement i missed the under sevens at wimborne have got a raffle um including um a bid for a a signed um jersey signed by sam sam Sim simmons oh, spit that one out um <laughs> that is being um bid on and all bids need to be in by the 18th of march they can either go to smacks here at the club um or to uh the email u7 at wimborne rugby club.co.uk that's u7 at wimborne rugby club.co.uk um uh, that's a lions jersey by the way that's signed by uh, sam simmons um and also a raffle tickets are one pound um lots of prizes in the raffle um including um some prizes uh, donated by green slade fish uh, awesome. nonetheless so if you're interested in, in the raffle or the shirt, certainly um, there's also some, some other bits and pieces, some great goodies in there. So if you have the opportunity, come down, buy a raffle ticket or put a bid in for the shirt. That would be great. You'd be helping out the sevens, uh, the under sevens down here at the club. Baz, best of luck for the rest of the season, mate. I think it's uh, already in the pipeline. There's going to be a bit of a mini bus down to your game against Hartbury. Um, Watch Willie uh, have a run out against Willow and stuff like that. But, mate, 
lovely, lovely to see you. James, yeah. off. Yeah, to everybody, thank you for listening. I um, hope you enjoy. If you get the opportunity and want to subscribe to our podcast um, so you're updated on any more podcasts that come out. Um, until next time, be more rugby. Thank you, Harry. Cheers, Baz. Cheers, boys. <laughs>